Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Hey, guys. All right, let's keep learning. Let's go. New new series. Great time for you to join the channel, by the way. Uh, love to have you. Uh, starting these two new series. <clears throat> I took a break on them for a while because Marshall is doing a great job. I'll, sometimes they're jerks. No, they're they're good. Uh, great job on, on the um, schedules and whatnot. And I'm starting these two new series, so great time to join. This and the Simone Boulevard. Simon, Simon, Simon Boulevard? Simone Boulevard. I can't even... I've only done one episode, so give me a break. All right, let's do it. Let's go. Just <laughs> original link to the video, top of the description, right below that. Link to the Discord, right below that. Link to my second channel, where I do more non-history-related things. Let's go. And difficulty. So today, most of the countries of Europe declared sides and fought in the First World War. But Sorry, pause it, but it's between this guy and arm, the armchair historian. I haven't done one of his videos in a while. Uh, with the best uh, setup. I might have to, I, I got to give it to this channel just because uh, the armchair historian has a really good graphic, but it's got the smoke and the pipe. And this guy has all these great, eventually I'm going to, you know, when I have money to spend on some cool historical artifact, I'm going to make sure the first one I get is something I really like and I can put it in the background there. They've got a bunch of things. Uh, so yeah, this is my favorite set background. Sorry, let's go. Most of the countries of Europe declared sides and fought in the First World War, but by no means all of them. And remaining neutral, while it certainly kept down the numbers of the dead, had its own unique set of problems and difficulties. So today, we'll look at one of the neutral nations of Europe, the Netherlands. Let's do it, if you are not ready to learn. Oh, this is... Was that like... I'm in... Great intro. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Home mech is down the hall. I will take... What's the uh, Scottish? Oh, I come on! I, I'm I'm <laughs> as if you can respond. Uh, the Scot Haggis, Haggis. That is what you can make me. Andy Nidell, welcome to a Great War special mm -hmm. episode about the Netherlands in the First World War. Neutrality was not something new to that nation. The Netherlands had practiced the politics of neutrality since 1839, when the Treaty of London had created an independent Belgium. Her Majesty the Queen of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and Ireland, His Majesty the Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary and Bohemia, His Majesty the King of the French, His Majesty the King of... are considered as having the same force and validity as if they were textually, textually inserted in the present act in the present act, and they are thus placed under the guarantee of their said majesties. Belgium, within the limits specified in Articles 1, 2, and 4, shall form an independent and perpetually neutral state. It shall be bound to observe such neutrality towards all other states. Someone. Out of the southern part of the Netherlands. If you want to get technical, there had been an earlier treaty in 1831, but the Dutch had refused to sign it. Anyhow, like the rest of Europe, the Netherlands had gone through an industrial revolution, as well as a migration of large parts of the population from the countryside to the cities and towns. The Netherlands was in an interesting position, though, for it was a small nation with large overseas possessions, so it had a lot to lose from any European conflict. And so Dutch neutrality was political, independent, and armed. Political because unlike, say, Swiss neutrality, it wasn't part of a constitution and was a policy that governments chose to follow. Independent because unlike Belgian neutrality, it wasn't guaranteed by other nations and armed because since it wasn't guaranteed, it maintained an army. Its peculiar neutrality made it a center for peace conferences like those of eight. Let me just say, I think it's also because, you know, Switzerland is up there in the Alps, and obviously he said the constitution they had, or what, anyways, the, the location, you know, you have a completely flat country that's in between, right in the middle, smack dab of France, UK, and Germany. You're right in the path of all of these warring countries, and so, yeah, it's much different than being right tucked up there in the Alps. Army. Its peculiar neutrality made it a center for peace conferences like those of 1899 and 1907, when Europe got together and agreed on just what was and was not acceptable during wartime, like no poison gas. We all know how that turned out. After Germany's unification in 1871, and for the next two generations, oh, the Dutch well- Sorry, Germany I love that. I'm a sucker for visuals. This is a... Something about this painting, it's just... I guess really nicely done shadows. 
I like that. His unification in 1871, and for the next two generations, the Dutch well realized that a new conflict between France and Germany was more than possible. So they made no secret of the fact that they were pursuing armed neutrality, since an invasion through the Netherlands wasn't a bad plan of attack. Indeed, the German Schlieffen plan to attack France initially did propose an invasion through both the Netherlands and Belgium to move troops faster and on a wider front. So the Dutch spent about a quarter of their annual budget on... Can I just say the Maginot Line? So I, I went to a part of it. It's one of the big things I wanted to do along with going to the Dachau um, concentration camp. Um, when me and my dad and brother went over to Europe. I, I feel like I'm talking about this way too much in recent episodes, but a lot of it is relevant. And I visited one of the, the places here, and I just don't understand how... Maybe there's a, there's a reason for it. There's an answer to my question, but they didn't extend it to the Atlantic for some reason. I, I know you could say, well, the border with Belgium is right there. Well, how can you not see that coming? You know what I mean? So I, I want to know the reasons why they didn't connect the, you know, from the Alps to the North Sea. Faster and on a wider front. So the or Dutch channel. spent about a quarter of their annual budget on defense, modernized the New Holland water line, and constructed Fortress Amsterdam, the last line of defense far from the borders. And Dutch politics in the years leading up to the war were all about maintaining neutral cred. Friendship with all, alliance with none, was pretty much the motto. In fact, if you look at the Boer Wars, which were the British fighting against the descendants of Dutch settlers in South Africa, the Dutch government remained both neutral and aloof, even though there was widespread public sentiment for the Boers. Still, as July 1914 rolled on and the continent slid toward war, the Dutch mobilized an army of 200,000 men, and the railways were put under military orders. On August 2nd, 1914, German Army Chief of Staff Helmut von Moltke declared that Germany would respect Dutch neutrality. But on the 4th, because of the German invasion of Belgium, the southern part of the Netherlands, below the River Waal, was placed in a state of war to protect the borders. If you're wondering how the Dutch army was organized, it was based on the German model. They had developed a mobile field army built on a divisional system, and most arms and armaments like were imported hats. from Germany and Austria-Hungary. The big difference between the Dutch and German armies, other than size, was that the Dutch army was strictly for defense and didn't really have much offensive capability. And this defense was in two parts, the mobile army for the border regions and the fortress defense for the heartland. Also, the Dutch had a shorter period of training, only eight and a half months. That last was actually a political concession opposed by the military. The mobilization went really smoothly under the direction of Dutch Army Chief of Staff C.J. Snyders. Germany did not invade any part of the Netherlands, and Britain, too, announced it would respect Dutch neutrality. But the invasion of Belgium caused serious chaos in the Netherlands. I mean, Neutrality is always going to have problems with smuggling, spirings, and border uh, activities. But the immediate problem was that of refugees. By the end of October 1914, an estimated Except one learning. million refugees had arrived in the Netherlands. Maybe it's not the right time to say it, but I, my, how my brain works, I just got to get it out. I just want to say, just this whole journey in, in YouTube, um, just thank you guys, one, just kind of out of nowhere so much for following and coming along with me on this journey. But... I notice I'm just I'm getting better at, at absorbing information for sure, and and I love that. Uh, so thank you guys for for allowing me to do this. That's very random, but just came into my brain and I had to get it out. Hirings and border activity, but the immediate problem was that of refugees. By the end of October 1914, an estimated one million refugees had arrived in the Netherlands from Belgium and France, which produced an immediate humanitarian crisis. They were spread out and housed throughout the country, which was logical to avoid the spread of disease and prevent chaos at the borders. And though most did return home eventually, tens of thousands remained for the duration of the war. I gotta say that people were very good about welcoming the refugees into their homes. In Rotterdam, for example, there were far more locations offered than there were actual refugees. But many soldiers oh. also fled to the Netherlands, and the Germans even built a 200 kilometer long electrical fence at the Dutch-Belgian border to prevent crossing. 2,000 volts. This was called the wire of death, and within 500 meters of the fence, if you could not explain your presence, you were executed on the spot. Between two oh, and three... I mean, that's insane, but I thought like you were going to get thrown into the fence and executed that way, but I...
3,000 people were victims. You were executed on the spot. Between two and 3,000 people were victims of the fence during the war. Let's look at the Dutch economy for a minute. Before the war, the Dutch economy was heavily dependent on foreign trade. They traded with both the British and the Germans, and though Dutch coffee, tea, and tobacco from the colonies was sent all over Europe, the Netherlands was poor in natural resources and imported fuel, raw materials, tools, and even basic foods from all over Europe. Under international law, they could legally trade with both sides during wartime, but Britain demanded that ships to Rotterdam not carry any goods bound for Germany, and the Dutch were now caught between giving in, which might cause war with Germany, or refusing, which might cause starvation if imports were stopped. So the Dutch trade minister created a grain bureau, a government monopoly that bought grain and guaranteed the British that it was only for domestic consumption. This might have worked, but the Dutch government refused to regulate the economy. A new trade minister, Volkert Postuma, was, however, pretty much forced to interfere in the economy. At first, this was to combat rising prices caused by rising costs of transporting things overseas to the Netherlands. But in 1916, and I'm leaving a lot out here, he divided agricultural exports equally between Germany and Britain to try to make everybody happy. But by this time, the problem was there were not enough ships getting into... I just want to say, uh, I, I, I've said this a lot in a, in a past few days too and i find that the more i learn about history and conflict no matter if it's alexander the great or if it's caesar or, or you know roman empire british empire spanish empire over in in china i have to learn more about uh southeast asian history or just east asian history but it always shows it always teaches me about just human psychology on top of the history because and it, maybe i'm so terrible uh this video at making coherent statements just it shows me how all of these conflicts in history are just so similar to individual human behavior i guess is is my way of saying it supply the country Happy. But by this time, the problem like, was okay. there were not enough ships getting in to you. supply the country. The war at sea had strangled imports, and once the Germans reintroduced unrestricted submarine warfare in early 1917, almost no Dutch ships would even leave port. In 1914, over 12,000 ships entered Dutch ports. By 1918, it was one-seventh of that. So food prices rose, and draconian government practices were enacted to conserve food. And in 1917, when potatoes were to be exported to Germany and Britain in exchange for coal and not given to the hungry Dutch, riots ensued. By 1918, the Netherlands faced famine for the first time in centuries. The darkest hour came in March 1918 when the Allies requisitioned all merchant ships in Dutch ports. Dutch Queen Wilhelmina called it a theft, and the threat of war grew as Germany demanded compensation. But at the 11th hour, the Allies withdrew their demands and allowed the Dutch to avoid war with Germany. And as the tide of the war soon turned in favor of the Allies, an agreement was made to limit Dutch-German trade in favor of the return of Allied imports. But new elections in September that toppled the Liberals from power and scattered riots in the army brought the threat of revolution along the lines of that in Russia. However, the government responded effectively. Snyder's was forced to resign. Demobilization was promised. Food rations were increased. And within days, the threat, though it hadn't been that serious, was over. And after the war, well, it's not my job to tell you what happened after the war. Whether or not the ex-Kaiser of Germany would re I love that answer. ...reside in Holland, how things would go economically. This was just a brief look at the incredibly complex situation of the Netherlands during the Great War, much of which I left out. Let's just say that the Dutch government had tried to build its policies on international law, but that was no match for might is right. And in reality, it was a shared interest in continuing Dutch neutrality by both the central and allied powers that kept that nation out of the war. The Netherlands was not the only country that stayed out of the war. Sweden was also neutral. And last summer, we made a special episode about how that played out. If you want to see that, you can click right here. Don't forget to subscribe.
special episode about how that played out, played out of the war. Sweden was also neutral. And last summer, we made a special episode about how that played out. Explain. You know who I'm talking to. Whoever it is who I'm talking to knows who I'm talking to. Two people. They will know. I love how he was at the end there, like, well, what happened after the war? What, where did their policies go? Well, that's not my job. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> this is just during the war. Great. Awesome. Uh, I keep blinking a lot. My eyes are dry because whenever I get to, like, you know, five videos in the day, especially when I'm, like, drinking coffee and I'm all, like, caffeined out, um, my eyes just get super dry and I start blinking every, like, second. And I'm sure, that can be annoying. Gonna have to deal with it though. All right, awesome video, great channel. Um, the uh, I can't believe I wasn't subscribed before. I think I did that before. I gave it the preemptive like. German East Africa World War One Colonial Warfare. Okay, all right. I was thought it was gonna be more of like a all right. So Netherlands, I see. Oh, Anzac. The new central. Bulgaria. Okay, South Africa. All right, awesome. Continue this, obviously. See you guys next time.